Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to begin. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. On behalf of the College Republicans at UCF, we want to thank you all for making it out tonight. Whether you are watching live from the Daily Wire Facebook page or YouTube channel, or if you are a student here at UCF, an active member in the community, or just wanted to hear an amazing speaker, we welcome you. My name is Didi Malika. I'm the Vice Chairman of the College Republicans here at UCF, and absolutely thrilled to be here with you all to hear from an amazing speaker. If you want to get involved with College Republicans, feel free to reach out to any of our executive members and follow us on social media at UCFGOP. Our club aims to be the premier conservative voice on, on our campus, and it is our goal to promote conservative ideas, beliefs, and values at the university, and to also promote discussion, debate, and the open flow of ideas. We are a very active group on campus. We recently hosted a debate with the College of Democrats. We table every week, and we have meetings every week in the student union. I want to give a big thank you to Young America's Foundation for making this event possible, and Robert and Patricia Herbold for sponsoring this lecture series. Andrew Claven is the author of such internationally best-selling crime novels as True Crime, filmed by Clint Eastwood, Don't Say a Word, filmed starring Michael Douglas, and Empire of Lies. Stephen King called him the most original novelist of crime and suspense since Cornell Woolrich. He has been nominated for the Mystery Writers of America's Edgar Award five times and has won twice. He has also won the Thumping Good Read Award from W.H. Smith. Andrew has written thrillers for young adults, including the best-selling Homelander series, which follows a heroic teenager's battle against terrorists. His essays and op-eds on politics, religion, movies, and literature have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, and elsewhere. Andrew Claven does a Monday through Thursday podcast, The Andrew Claven Show, for The Daily Wire. Please save your questions until the end, as there will be an open Q&A. Now please join me in welcoming the newest member to the UCF Knight Nation, Andrew Claven. Thank you to the college Republicans and to YAP, and I, I appreciate the welcome. I heard they were tearing my picture down and writing OK Boomer across my... <laughs> <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to find the guy and write, get off my lawn, went back. <laughs> I told, I, it's true, I told my wife, you know, I said, these kids don't seem to be able to resist writing on my forehead, and she, and she said, I know, I always want to do that too. <laughs> so, so now I have to sleep with one eye open. Uh, my policy is I, I try to talk as briefly as possible because I really want to talk to you. I want to answer questions. Um, I want to hear what, what you're thinking about. Uh, I don't care uh, whether you're far left or alt right. Uh, I'm not going to be calling your names. I'm not going to be shaking my fist at you. I really want to hear what you have to say. Uh, my friend Shapiro has a, a policy that he asks people who disagree with him to come down first, but uh, Unlike Shapiro's speeches, my speeches are guaranteed 100% correct. <laughs> so, so my advice is if you disagree with me, you should just sit quietly and try to figure out where you went wrong. <laughs> um, I, I called this uh, the speech The Art of Being Free. I, I think this is the uh, last speech I'm going to give this year. I don't like to travel really after the holidays start. I like to be with my family. And I, I, there re really was something I wanted to say. I've been traveling around all year. Uh, and I've seen a lot of uh, campuses, and I wanted to talk to you about some of the stuff that really disturbed me, um, and some of the stuff that I think is, is actually kind of dangerous uh, that worries me. Because you are, right this minute, uh, the freest, richest, healthiest human beings who have ever existed on planet Earth. Uh, you're probably gonna live longer than anyone ever has. Uh, the poorest person in this room can walk into the cheapest mini-mart and buy food that would have been the envy of the emperor of Rome. You have the library of the world in your pocket. Uh, Aristotle and William Shakespeare would have ripped off their arm to have the phone that you guys have. You may run into some racism in your life, but probably not much. Uh, if you're a, a lady, you're probably going to have more choices than any woman on earth has ever had. 
The economy's good. We're not in any major wars. You wouldn't know it to watch the news, but actually, this is a great moment, and you lucky guys are actually living in it. And at the same time, the suicide rate in America climbed 33% over the last 20 years. Over the last 10 years, the suicide rate among young people, people 10 to 24, your age group, climbed 56%, 56% in 10 years. So many people are killing themselves that the life expectancy in America is going down in spite of the fact that we've got all these new medications and these new procedures. It really is if, I mean, in the Bible, God says to the people, I put before you life and death, choose life. It's as if in this country we've had life put in front of us as it's never been put in front of anybody before and we're choosing death. And even the young people I meet who aren't in despair don't seem all that happy to me, you know. Uh, on the right, we make fun of what we call snowflakes, the leftist snowflakes. They show up and they're always getting triggered and they need their shit safe spaces and everybody's hateful. And I was in Boston, at Boston College uh, just a few weeks ago. There was a near riot for me, one of the nicest people I know. <laughs> and we laugh at that. But it's not really that funny, you know? It's, I mean, these are young, strong, healthy American men and women. Who told them that they couldn't listen to ideas they disagreed with? Who told them that they were so fragile that they were going to be traumatized if anybody said something they didn't like? Who told them? And my question is, why did they tell them? What do they want? What are they after? I've talked this year and the last year to a lot of conservative students who are afraid to speak their minds. They're afraid to say what they have to say. Now, I hear you have a pretty solid uh, presence in this campus, but I've been to campuses where they are under the gun all the time. They're afraid to even write in an essay in class what they think because they're afraid their teacher will mark them down. They're afraid of getting ratioed, afraid of getting canceled. And I think to myself, <laughs> A professor is supposed to be teaching you how to think. Not just how to think, but how to speak your mind, how to act with integrity and talk with integrity, how to be bold in your beliefs and open to new ideas. And they're teaching you the exact opposite. They're teaching so many of these students the exact opposite, teaching them to lie, to hide, to be afraid. Why are they doing that? What do they want? Now, recently at some of our events, uh, the conservative events, there have been people who now call themselves uh, America First Nationalists, or sometimes they call them the alt-right or groipers, uh, which is a very unpleasant word, groiper. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think some conservatives have overreacted to this. They get angry. They're afraid of being tarred with the same brush or being linked to them. And I don't feel that way. I, but I have read some of the material of their leaders, uh, some of the stuff they put out. I've watched some of their YouTube videos. And there is a strain of, of real hatred in it, of real racial hatred. They deny it, but it's in the materials, uh, anti-Semitism, a, a kind of attack on, on gays that's not a philosophical attack, not philosophically thinking homosexuality is immoral, but an actual personal dislike. And I look at them, too, and I think, Shouldn't you look at people with a little suspicion who sell you that, who tell you to hate your neighbor, who say in the name of Christ you're supposed to be hating your neighbor, who tell you to be angry at people because of the color of their skin or their religion? What do they want? I mean, don't you ever want to ask yourself, why are they telling me to feel that way? What are they after? One of the West's founding stories is a story about Socrates, which I hope some of you know. Uh, Socrates' friend went to the oracle at Delphi and asked if Socrates was the wisest man. And the oracle said, there's no man wiser than Socrates. And Socrates heard that and said, that can't be true, because I know that I don't know anything. And so Socrates started going around Athens talking to all the experts, the politicians and the poets and the people who made things, trying to prove the oracle wrong. And what he found is each of these people thought they knew a lot, 
but they really didn't know anything. And Socrates realized he was the wisest man because he knew he knew nothing. And that's one of the founding stories of our civilization. And it's a story about humility. It's a story about approaching the truth slowly and maybe not jumping to conclusions. And yet, all on, the, on all these college campuses I go to, everyone is absolutely certain about things that no one knows. There is no science, there is zero science that says we're going to die from climate change in 12 years, none. It's an open question whether computer predictions about a system as complex as the climate constitute science at all. I'm not sure that's a science at all. And yet, they put out a Green New Deal which is guaranteed to devastate the economy and destroy every freedom you have without any guarantee that it's going to make one scintilla of difference to the future of the climate, and people march off to follow it like it's the second coming. Nobody knows what transgenderism is. Nobody knows. They don't know if it's got a physical component. They don't know if it's purely a psychological problem. They don't know if it's psychosexual. Nobody knows. So shouldn't we be just logically a little bit cautious before we, say, alter a child's body in a way that he can never change back again? Shouldn't we discuss whether a man who declares he's a woman should be able to compete with girls who have given up so much of their lives to becoming excellent at their sports. You know, in, in England, this is an absolutely true story. In England, a violent male criminal was arrested, declared that he was a woman, and was put in a woman's prison where he proceeded, you can finish the sentence, he proceeded to rape all the other prisoners. Shouldn't we be just a little bit cautious about something we know nothing about? On the other side of this, all science says that there are differences between men and women from the moment they're born. Girls pay more attention to people. Boys pay more attention to things. Men who are transgender and transition start to take blockers of male hormones and they start to take supplementary female hormones and they report that they become more emotional. They report that they suddenly are more interested in domestic matters and less interested in stories in the newspaper. They report that they like different stuff all of a sudden in bed. And yet Google's James Damore was fired from his job. He lost his livelihood for suggesting that maybe there were more men in tech than women because men like tech better than women. Now, maybe he was wrong. He, he could have been entirely wrong. Maybe one day women will like sitting in a cubicle pounding numbers into a computer as much as some men do. I doubt it. But maybe they will. I, you know. I, but do you fire a guy for that? Really? Really? Are you so certain that he's wrong that you take away his paycheck and the way he makes a living? You know, the differences between men and women are the inspiration of every song ever written, most of the stories ever told, and for a huge majority of us, they are one of the prime sources and consolations, prime sources of joy and consolations for a tragic life. Who told us that we were supposed to hate each other about this? Who told us that this was a problem? Again, one of the prime sources of joy, why, how did we get to the point where we're yelling at each other? I told you I, was, I had a near riot at Boston College, and the reason was they published a newspaper uh, story about me just before I got there saying I was Islamophobic. A category of people I believe doesn't exist. Nobody is phobic about Islamic people. I mean, phobic means an irrational fear. Nobody woke up one day irrationally fearing, you know, I don't know why, I suddenly just have this weird irrational fear of Islam. No, I have asked serious questions and I've asked comical questions about the philosophy of Islam, wondering if some of the ideas in Islam have contributed to the violence that is endemic in the Islamic world. Islam is involved in almost every major conflict on earth and has been involved in every major conflict on earth except the Mexican drug wars since the end of the Vietnam War. They're fighting Christians, they're fighting other Muslims, they're fighting Buddhists, Jews, secular people. It could be something about Islam and it must be the ideas because it's not a race, right? They're all different races of, Muslim, of Islam. I also question some Christian uh, ideas. 
I question Catholic ideas about sexuality and whether they may be contributed to the scandal in the church. I, got the, I went to speak to an evangelical group in the newspaper that time said pro-gay speaker coming to, to speak because I've questioned ideas about homosexuality in my, from my fellow Christians. Am I Christian phobic? No. We're here to question each other's ideas. First of all, it's one of the prime joys of life. It's one of the most interesting things you can do is argue about ideas. It also makes your ideas better. When your ideas are challenged, you have to come up with better reasons for them. Sometimes you have to change your mind. This is the way we go forward. And if you're not going to question ideas, why should, why should we build these buildings? Why should we build this university? Why should we be here at all? In this free, peaceful, rich, powerful country, the freest, richest, most peaceful, and powerful country that has ever existed at one of the best times in history, how did we get to be hating each other so much? How did we get this angry? What do the people who made us this angry want? Well, let me tell you first what I want, okay? Because I'm a little different than other conservative speakers. I want one thing, and that is I want you to be free. I want you to be free. You can have all kinds of different opinions. You're smart people. We're not going to agree on everything. Luckily, I'm so old that before you can screw everything up, I'm going to be having lunch with Jesus, all right? <laughs> but I want you to be free. I want you to be free to speak your mind, even when your opinions are unpopular and seem hateful to other people. I want you to be free to choose your path in life, even if somebody else thinks it's wrong. I want you to be free to decide how you spend your own money. This is a big part of freedom, how to spend your own money. Money is not just money. Money is your time. You use your time to make money. When they take your money, they take your time. When they take your time, they take your life. Your life is made of time. And when they take your money, they are taking control of your life. The definition of slavery is that you do the work and someone more powerful than you decides how to spend the money. That's also the definition of socialism. Same damn thing. You do the work, someone more powerful than you decides how to spend your money. They are taking your time. They are taking your life. I want you to be enthusiastic, eager participants in this unique American exper experiment in limited government and personal liberty. And so I want to be honest with you when I tell you that the freedom, the kind of freedom I'm talking about is not easy, it's hard. Everything good, as you must know already in life, is hard. Love is hard. Peace is hard. Wealth is hard. Staying in shape is hard. It's all hard. You have to work at it. Now, one hard thing about freedom, and this, this is one thing that drives almost everybody crazy about it, including me, is that in order for you to be free, you have to allow other people to be free. I hate that. <laughs> you can't be free by stepping on another guy's throat because one day somebody's going to come along who's bigger than you to step on your throat. It's that simple, right? You have to have a system, an agreement, that everybody is going to be free. That has to be in place. If you want to speak your mind, you have to let other people speak. You can't define somebody else's ideas as hate speech because eventually the bigger guy is going to come along and define your ideas as hate speech. There's only free speech and speech governed by the powerful. Those are the only two kinds of speech there are, okay? Free speech and speech that's run by the powerful because the weak people can't decide what hate speech is. If you want to go to your way, other people have to go their way. You're gay and you want to get married, go ahead. But if somebody doesn't want to cater your wedding, you got to leave them be, even if it hurts your feelings. Freedom is hard on the feelings. Another way freedom is hard is that it's very unsafe. It's risky. It's frightening. It entails taking responsibility for yourself and paying your own way. If you can't decide how other people spend your money, you can't take their money to spend it on what you want to spend it on. If you want to build a business, whether it's Lehman Brothers or the Bernstein Brothers delicatessen, and it fails, you shouldn't be able to bail it out with taxpayer money because that's not your money. That's somebody else's money. Somebody else earned that. If you want to sleep around, knock yourself out, 
But when you get pregnant or you get an STD or when you're miserable and enslaved on the drugs you took, it's not my fault. You can't take my money. I earned that money. That's my time. That's my life. You have to pay for yourself. If you went in debt to go to school, you can't suddenly turn around and say, pay my debt. I didn't take out the money. You took out the debt. It's dangerous. Every time that Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders says, you know, I happen to believe that everybody should have free health care, right? Wait till, I, wait till I do my imitation of Goofy. Those are my only two imitations. <laughs> Every time he says that, he is taking somebody else's freedom. And when he takes that freedom, he's taking your freedom. Because if their money's not safe, your money's not safe. All this free stuff they're giving you is not free. And the conservatives are always saying, well, how much is that going to cost? Never mind how much it's going to cost in money. What's it going to cost in freedom? You are handing over to the government the right to take your earnings away. Now, maybe the hardest thing about freedom is that nobody really wants it. This is another founding story of the West. And they don't tell it enough. It's the founding story of Exodus in the Bible. The Hebrews are slaves in the land of Egypt. They whip them. They starve them. They kill their children. God sees their suffering and sends Moses to free them. Moses performs unbelievable miracles through God performs these miracles through Moses. Frogs fall out of the sky. The water turns to blood. The Egyptian, the Egyptian children die. Finally, Pharaoh says, all right, let the people go. The slaves take off. They hit the Red Sea. And Pharaoh says, forget it. I'm sending my armies after them, sends the most powerful armies on earth after these slaves. God parts the waters of the Red Sea. They walk through the dry, uh, dry land. The armies come after them, and they drown. God drowns them in the water. I mean, amazing miracles that set these people free. They walk into the desert. There's nothing to eat. They turn to Moses and said, why did you take us out of Egypt? We were, we were happy there. We had food. Everything was great. Why did you do that? People don't want to be free. They want to be fed. They want to be safe. They want to be taken care of. They want to be children forever. Except for Pharaoh. Except for the people who want power. And the people who want power know one thing. They know most people don't want to be free. They know if they offer to feed you. They know if they offer to keep you safe. They know if they offer to treat you like children. You will give them power. And you will lose your freedom. And by the way, that's the way it's always been until folks got here. That was the way it has always been. And I, I lived in England, one of the freest countries on earth. They're nothing like as free as we are. There is nothing on earth like, like the freedom we have here. It's unique. It pops up only every now and again in history, and it dies fast, and then it doesn't come back for a long time. So when you ask yourself what people want when they stir you up, stir up your passions, and point at one another and say, oh, there's a fascist, there's a sexist, there's a black person, there's a Jew, there's a homosexual, uh, you know, there's a, hate, a hater. What they're doing is they're pointing you away from the main thing you have, which is your freedom. They're trying to get you angry, divided, passionate, and unthinking so that you will give them their freedom. And they do this sometimes sounding like it's the best intentions. I mean, Bernie is a good example. I'll bet, I'm not sure, but I'll bet there's a diversity officer at this school. Most schools have a diversity officer. Most diversity officers make six figures, more than the professors who are teaching you what you came here to learn. They got an office, they got a big title, they got six figures. Just think for a minute. A ask yourself this for a minute. Is that guy ever going to come in and say, you know what, we're diverse enough. Everything's great. Nobody's <laughs> Take my office, take my six figures, take my car, take my title. I'm done. The job is done. Never. It's never going to happen, right? They want the power. They want the money. They are there. Once they're there, you will never get rid of them because they will never say the job is done ever, ever, right? So freedom is so hard and annoying and messy. Why do I want you to have it? If the natural way of things is one person rules and everybody else follows, why not just fall into the natural way? And the reason is, without freedom, you will never know joy. 
you will never have the full life that God meant you to have. In the Declaration, it says that God gave you certain rights, among them the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we talk about happiness sometimes as if they want you to be happy, like you just had a great date, or you just made a lot of money, or something like that. That's not the kind of happiness they were talking about. That happiness comes and goes. When sad things happen, you'll be sad. When happy things happen, you'll be happy. The kind of happiness that the founders were talking about is what the Greeks called eudaimonia, means good spirit. It really means human flourishing. It's what Jesus called life in abundance. That's what they wanted you to pursue. They wanted you to pursue eudaimonia. Where does it come from? Well, Aristotle said that it came from virtue, that people did not experience eudaimonia until they had virtue. And Jesus said that virtue largely consists of loving God and loving your neighbor as you love yourself. And I will tell you, from a lifetime's experience and a lifetime, a fairly joyous lifetime, that all your joy, 100%, not 90%, 100% of your joy will come from virtue through love. It will come from loving what is good. If you love what is worthless, like porn or drugs or money, you will not have joy. If you love what is worthwhile, like God and human beings and the service that you can perform with the talent you were born with, you will have a joyful life. And all you got to do is think it through. You can't have love if you're not free. If you're not free to choose your love, it's not love at the point of a sword. You can't have virtue at the point of the sword. You have to be able to choose it. It's not charity when Elizabeth Warren takes this guy's money and gives it to this guy. It's charity when you reach into your pocket and say, I would have liked to go to the movies, but here's five bucks. Go buy yourself a burger. That's charity. That hurts. That's hard. Everything else is just degrading. So if this is freedom is so worthwhile, how do you get it? If people are so easily enslaved, and some people want to be pharaoh, how do you create a government that's free? And that was the question our founding fathers were tasked with. They had a brand new country, and they needed to know how they could overcome the natural slavishness of humankind and the natural power hunger of humankind and make people free. Well, obviously, the easy part is the government has to be limited, right? You have to limit the government. They wrote a constitution with what they call enumerated powers. If it ain't in the constitution, they're not supposed to be able to do it. The federal government is not supposed to be able to do what is not in the constitution. It's been a long time since we've treated the constitution like that, but that's the way it's supposed to work. And the other thing is you have to set people off against one another. You have to make it so that whenever somebody has power, somebody else has power that he doesn't want to give to that guy. They want people to fight one another for the power. The legislator fighting the presidency, president, the president being uh, hemmed in by the law. This is what James Madison wrote in the Federalist Papers. He said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. A dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government, democracy, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. The government they built is a great big machine for keeping us off each other's backs. That's what it is. And that system is your inheritance. The centers of power that conflict with other centers. The systems that keep things in place. I mean, this is one of my great beefs with the left, is that whenever they don't get what they want, they want to break the system. They lose an election, they want to get rid of the Electoral College. They lose the majority in the Supreme Court, they want to pack the court. They lose the argument, they want to silence us. They want to shut us down and declare any one thing that disagrees with them hate speech. This government that is your inheritance is what they are trying to distract you from when they try and get you to hate one another. Because it depends on us essentially loving one another. 
It depends on us being willing to let each other be free. And it depends on us being willing to lose when the system says we lose, which is really tough. I'll, I'll finish up. I want to finish up because I want to, yeah, I want to uh, talk to you. But let me just point out two Supreme Court cases. One is Roe v. Wade and the ones that followed that declared abortion a constitutional right. And the other is Obergefell, which made uh, gay marriage a constitutional right. I have two completely different attitudes about these two decisions, the results of these decisions, but I hate both of them. Abortion to me is just, you can't make an excuse for it. Baby is not your body, it's not your choice, it's a new person, you're the mom, you can't kill it. I understand there are terrible things that happen, you still can't solve your problems by killing babies. That's just not the way life should be. Gay marriage, you know, at this point, I'd rather have gay people in committed, loving relationships than in bathhouses catching and spreading diseases. I mean, that's basically the way it goes. So both of these decisions give me a, a different feeling in terms of their result, but I hate both of them because not in neither of them does the government do what the Constitution says it is allowed to do. There is no constitutional right to an abortion. There is no constitutional right to gay marriage. They made it up. And in making it up, they're not giving you a right. They're taking away your right to govern yourself. They're taking away your right to vote in Florida the way you want to live, to make the laws in your neighborhood what you want them to be. That's what they're taking away from you. And in Scalia dissented in the Obergefell decision. And it's one of the great dissents of all time. If you ever have a chance to read it, you should. But here are just two sentences. He says, it's not of special importance to me what the law says about marriage. He doesn't care. He says, you can make any law you want about marriage. He says, it is of overwhelming importance, however, who it is that rules me. Today's decree says that my ruler and the ruler of 320 million Americans coast to coast is a majority of the nine lawyers on the Supreme Court. The process is your freedom. The process has to be defended. You know, the art of being free is really the art of life. It's the art of being humble, knowing how little you know so that you listen to other people and let them live the way they want to live. It's the art of forgiveness, of being slow to judge. It's the art of being grateful for the things that have been handed down to you and being careful not to destroy them and holding on to them even when people try to stir up your passions so that you throw them carelessly away. You guys are going into a new world that I am not going to get to see. You're going to have machine parts put into your brain so that your IQs are higher than they've ever been. You may go to other planets. You may be part human, part machine. I don't know what it's going to be. And all along, every step of the way, there's going to be someone to tell you that the process is old-fashioned, that the Constitution is out of date, that you're the world is too complicated for you to make decisions about it. You need to hand it over to the experts, to the bureaucrats, to the agencies. And this is what I want to tell you, and then I'll be done. No matter what happens, no matter what new things come along, the old truths are going to remain exactly the same. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Judge not, lest you be judged. Love your neighbor as yourself. All your joy is going to be found in love and virtue, and there is no true love, and there is no true virtue unless you're free to choose them. Thank you very much, and I'd love to hear this. Thank you. So I hope that was the line for questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Clavin, for coming out here and speaking on your behalf of um, art of freedom speech. We will now be taking questions, so whoever can get up and make their way to the, towards the end of the aisle and assist from, get assistance from Luke and Carly. If you disagree with Drew, you can come across to the beginning of the If you disagree aisle. with me, get out. Don't listen yeah. to me. He wants to speak first. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Clayton. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thank you. 
All right. Good evening, Mr. Cleveland. Hi. Thank you for coming out today. I have one question for you. So if you had 60 seconds to talk to your 18-year-old self and give him one piece of advice, what would that be? Oh, man, my 18-year-old self was so messed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think what I would tell him is to keep his head down and get a great education. Um, the thing that I was most foolish about in my life is all the writers. I wanted to be a writer. That's all I ever wanted to be. And all the writers I loved uh, put experience at the top of the list of things that a writer should have. So I was crazy. I wandered around the country. I lived in hobo camps. I did all this crazy stuff just to get experience. And it really only occurred to me after I first dropped out of college, and I was a reporter for a while. I covered one of the biggest crimes in the country at, at 19. And I suddenly thought, no, there's stuff in, that only, you can only learn from books. There's stuff you can only learn from people who read books. I had to spend 15 years of my life reading the books that I didn't read in college. Uh, and so what I would tell myself is, you know what, get, get a really good education. Don't worry about what people are telling you. Don't worry about what you have to do. Just get the education first. That, that would be it. Sure. Then I'd smack them one. Hi, Mr. Clayman. Uh, uh, first, I just want to thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, I myself am a journalism major here at UCF, and uh, something that I aspire to do throughout my career is kind of shine light to a lot of the media bias and media corruption that's going on. Uh, there's a lot of examples like Jeff Zucker at CNN right now and ABC's cover-up of Epstein and everything. How would you recommend I go about my career with integrity and staying true to myself and my values without pissing off everyone that I want to work for? <laughs> Well, first of all, the corruption at the, main, in the, at the mainstream news level, at the level of uh, the networks, is so extreme that I don't know if you can actually do that at that level. Uh, you know, the ABC not only killed the Epstein story. I mean, remember, the, Bill Clinton traveled around with Epstein. The Epstein story was killed when Hillary Clinton was running for president. George Stephanopoulos, who helped Bill Clinton, shut up the women who were accusing him, is now the chief newsman at ABC. We don't know if he had anything to do with killing, but that's how corrupt they are. CBS then fired somebody for ABC who they thought might have released the information. Not, not, they're not investigating uh, Epstein at ABC. They're investigating who released the information that they killed the story. That, that is incredible corruption, and it's obviously corruption that's deeply connected to the Democrat Party. So. The good news is that obviously with all this uh, t new technology, new venues have sprung up. I mean, look, the, the Daily Wire, that, that's four years. Four years it became one of the biggest sites in the world. Uh, and uh, that's an amazing journey. I mean, four years ago we were in Jeremy's pool house, me and Ben, at a car table doing 15-minute podcasts, and now the place is a TV studio. It's really fast. So there's plenty of venues that will let you say what you have to say. The great need in journalism, as far as I'm concerned, is for actual information. There's plenty of uh, opinion, opinion work, and that's the easiest work probably to get. But there are very few good reporters out there. There are very few people on the scene, very few people who go through, do this stuff you have to do where you go through documents, because that, that is expensive. If you can become good at that, you become priceless. You know. And somebody like Cheryl Atkinson, who was fired from CBS for running, uh, she's a great uh, investigative reporter, she was fired for running bad stories about Obama, even though she had run bad stories about Bush, but she, was, she lost her job for that. You know, she, she now has her, basically her own little network because she is somebody who knows how to get a story. So that's what I would say. It's, it's the same thing I tell writers. Learn the craft. Learn the craft of journalism. Everybody has an opinion. But if you can go out and get the news, you'll get work. Okay. Considering, in your opinion, that freedom is the greatest thing we have, do I not have the choice to be free and enjoy things that make me happy? You mentioned drugs or any of the numerous things that we think are bad. If freedom is the biggest thing I have, should it not be my freedom to be happy from those things? Why is happiness only from virtue and from these other things? Yeah, no, you have the freedom to do those things. I'm telling you they won't make you happy. I'm telling you that you know, there are plenty of things in life that make you happy in the moment. You know, I mean, cheating on your spouse. 
is fun when you do it. It's only over time that you realize that you've lost your integrity, you know, that you've lost everybody you love, you know. Drugs are the same way. They'll make, they'll make you thrilled when you do it. Hatred is the same way, by the way. Hatred makes you feel really powerful and strong. It's only over time that it destroys your soul. You don't have to take my word for it. I would. <laughs> so, so, you know, the thing is, because I believe so strongly in freedom, I believe cultural problems can only be solved by cultural means. And when people feel that their life is meaningless, you can't pass a law giving it meaning. You have to teach them the meaning, right? So I can't force you not to take drugs. I can't force you not to do those things. You're free to do them. You're absolutely free to do them. I'm telling you what I've seen. Uh, since 2016, um, the MCAT has added a psychology and sociology section. In this section, future medical school students are required to learn feminist theory, uh, Marxism, and the idea that reality is a social construct. <laughs> um, is there any hope for these universities, or is it lost now that science has also been taken over? Science is really in danger in the universities from the left. It really is. And the only thing about science is that because it deals with reality and because reality is not a, a social construct, but reality, uh, you know, you have to imagine that this is the place where things will fall apart. Nobody's going to go to a surgeon who comes in and says, eh, you know, I'll take out your kidney, maybe your pancreas, I don't know, you know, it's going to be whatever, whatever the social construct is. So you have to assume that at some point this falls apart. The thing that I think is really a danger is the, the cowardice of people when the, the, who don't stand up against it. The fact that, you know, if somebody teaches feminist theory and, and you say, well, that's ridiculous, feminist theory has nothing to do with surgery, then they say, well, you don't believe in the rights of women? And people cave in instantly, you know? So I think that we really do need to have the courage to speak up. I think it is the absolute first virtue is courage because without it, there's no other virtue. And you know, when you ask me if there's hope, of course there is. You know, I've seen plenty of things that looked like they were just going down the drain forever. I've seen plenty of things turn around, so there's hope. But people are going to have to fight for it, because you, you're right about this. This is really damaging. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Clavin. Um, Big Vinegar podcast and your other works, especially Empire of Lies. Uh, my question is, uh, is if you've, as a high church Anglican, have you ever heard of the personal ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter? That's the uh, Catholic Church's uh, structure for former Anglicans and Episcopalians uh, started by Pope Benedict in 2012. Uh, their liturgy is uh, it's approved by the Catholic Church, and it's uh, based on the more traditional right one of the 79 Book of Common Prayer. Um, there's a parish uh, here in Orlando that does that, about 20 miles away, and there's also uh, three in near Los Angeles, and uh, wondering if you have any thoughts on that and if you would ever consider attending such a place. You know, um, I, I, I've only heard of that, and I don't know anything about it, so I can't speak at length about it. I've been so alienated from the uh, Episcopal Church because of its radicalization. Uh, it's become incredibly political, and you really can't do I, I actually attended a service where an Easter service, so help me, I'm not making this up, where the priest got up and said, Jesus died for the little transgender boy who can't use the girl's bathroom because of our binary attitudes towards sex. And I thought, you know, okay, just show me the verse, you know, just show, not, you know, and I'm, I'm, because I'll believe anything I read in scripture, man, you know, just show me the verse. So I left the Episcopal Church recently, I've been going to a, 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 a nice Presbyterian church where I, uh, where I feel comfortable with what the guy is saying. He's just preaching the gospel, which is what I want to hear. Um, my, even though I love the Catholic liturgy, I truly do love the Catholic liturgy, and my, the Nicene Creed is basically my faith, my first priority is my relationship with Christ, and anywhere I feel that I'm improving that, I'll, I'll be there. And so I'm not somebody who gets overly tied up in doctrine because I feel that there are various doctrines uh, that will get you into relationship with Christ, and that's what I feel is important. All right, thank you for coming here. Um, the Minnesota Twins Adoption Study conducted by Professor Thomas Bouchard shows that twins that grow up in completely separate environments often take up the same professions and hobbies 
have similar personalities, and have even experienced similar psychotic episodes. Researchers were shocked at just how similar they ended up. Studies like these and others show genetics play a substantive role in individual and group traits and personalities. Do you believe that genes play an important role in the development of humans? Well, of course genes play an important role, but I don't believe that they uh, are dispositive. And uh, you can actually tell in, in twins, twins also go off in very different ways, uh, kind of shockingly. So look, we all know there's such a thing as genetics, but we don't know as much about it as people think we do. That's the first thing. And in the end, if you don't believe that people have free will, uh, then there's no, really not much talk, uh, point in talking about what people do anyway, because it's all kind of programmed in there. And I do believe people have free will. I think it's obvious people have free will. It's obvious from our internal experience that we have free will. So I, I, wouldn't, dismiss, I wouldn't dismiss genes. But I always find myself talking about genetics with people who've never really studied genetics, and I think that, I think that um, we know a lot less than we think we do. Go ahead. <laughs> um, do you believe that the West is more successful than a, a continent like Africa because we have more freedom, or do you think it's because of different reasons? Oh, I, uh, you know, I think, see, th this is where my goofy imitation comes in. Because, <laughs> because really, the the material that goes into a civilization is so vast, so diverse, comes from so many different places, that to peg it on genetics or skin color or, or race is goofy level thinking. I mean, even goofy wouldn't fall for that. The complexity is so great. And the way you know, here's how you know this. Here's how you know it, okay? In Britain, it was the Irish who were the bad guys, the dumb guys, the guys who couldn't accomplish anything. The Irish came to America and were very successful. In uh, Russia, it were the Jews who were the criminal class. The Jews, came, they were such a criminal class that when the Russian Jews came to Germany, the German Jews didn't want to know them. But when they came to America, they thrived. It always kills me when people who love Western civilization, as I love Western civilization, I actually think Western civilization and European civilization is so far the pinnacle of human achievement. It had to happen somewhere. I think it, it, it happened there. But what kills me about Western civilization is it was built by the people that the Romans thought were the barbarians. When the Romans talked about building a wall, it was the Europeans they wanted to keep out. Right? They thought these guys were the worst of the worst. They thought they were absolutely the stupidest people on earth. They went off and built a civilization. This happens all the time. It happens all the time. It is amazing what environment will do, and it is even more amazing what good ideas will do. Good ideas, I, I think it's always about following the ideas. Good ideas can transform anybody. And I think that our civilization, look, <laughs> So, so much goes into these things that the limitation, uh, that limiting the goodness of a society to one as uh, angle, one aspect, is just, it's just ridiculous. S chance goes into it, weather goes into it, uh, ideas that come from you don't know where go into it. But always the one thing we can do is pick between good ideas and bad ideas, and that's, that's I think, our, our only chance to move forward. Good evening. Hi. Um, so I'm in high school, and I've been very outspoken about some of the things that I believe in, particularly about capitalism. Uh -huh. And I get a lot of questions from students, even though 50% of them don't really even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but um, you know, I'll try to explain it in certain forms. But my question is, how do I explain capitalism to a student who doesn't even know what a free enterprise is? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I always like to start with, with freedom, because one thing that people your age all want is freedom because they're, they're getting too big to be where they are and they're getting too big to have their parents in control of them and they know they want freedom. So when you explain that your money, it, you know, money is just a symbol, right? It's just a piece of paper has no value. Its value is in the fact that you earned it, that you gave people something they desire, like an iPhone, and they gave you money in return. This is your life. This is your time that you create. And when people take your money, they take your, your choice away. If, I, if you say to me, I just worked a, a, in a store on a construction site for eight hours, and they gave me 50 bucks, and I say, great, I'm going to take that 50 bucks because I know how to spend it better than you, right? That's not being free. That's not you being free. I'm just taking your whole day away. So I always begin with those first principles, you know, because nobody really understands. You know, when you talk about the free market, 
people, all kinds of experts are arguing about that. But the one thing I do understand is when you take my money, you've taken my time. You've taken the sweat of my brow. When they freed the slaves in America, Lincoln said, no one has the right to the sweat of another man's brow. That's what socialism is. So when you start to explain it in those very basic terms, I think people can start to get it. Hi, Mr. Clavin. Uh, thank you for being here. It kind of feels weird just saying Mr. I feel like you should have a title ahead of that. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about an event that happened in March of 2016. A lot of people here may not remember it, and there were a lot of, a lot of these college students, they may not have even been old enough to, to vote at the time or pay much attention to politics, but uh, in March of, uh, March of 2016, it was during the, um, the Republican primaries that there was an event in South Florida where uh, a reporter named Michelle Fields claimed that Corey Lewandowski who was Trump's campaign yeah. manager, grabbed her by the arm and threw her to the ground. Uh, came out later in video evidence, very clearly, security camera footage, there were cameras all over the place, came out she was lying about it. It absolutely did not happen the way that she said it happened. But what was interesting about that moment, and I may not have mentioned Breitbart reporter, she was at Breitbart. Um, the Breitbart editor-in-chief, Ben Shapiro at the time, came out and, and vigorously defended her and, and demanded that, that Breitbart take her story seriously and do more, and, and he quit. He quit almost immediately. And what it looked like to me was she wanted attention, or maybe she hated Donald Trump and wanted to destroy his campaign, but I don't think Ben Shapiro wanted attention. I think Ben Shapiro was looking for an opportunity to destroy Donald Trump's campaign in its infancy. And I wanted to ask you, not only that, there's something else that happened this past weekend. You had um, YAF, who's hosting the event here today, Young America's Foundation, they essentially blacklisted and sought to destroy the career of Michelle Malkin simply for uh, supporting nationalism and populism. And with these two, these two associations you have, you have the Daily Wire on one hand, which is Ben Shapiro, you got YAF on the other. I want to know if you believe in guilt by association. All right, well, first of all, there's two, two big questions and I'm going to answer them both. First, you're just wrong about the Michelle Fields story. You're wrong twice. For, first of all, the, the, the video did not show that she was lying. The video was, was confusing and it was a little difficult. I, I know Michelle, I mean, I don't know her that well, but I knew her. It, it looked to me, when I looked at the video, it looked to me like she was being thrown down or at least manhandled. But the thing that you're mostly wrong about is you're wrong about Ben, and the reason I know it is Ben called me before he quit Breitbart, and he was tremendously upset. He didn't want to leave. He was giving up a substantial portion of his income. The idea that he was trying to destroy the campaign of Donald Trump, which hadn't even really gotten taken off at that point, he was, he was really upset that he had to leave. Uh, he, he called me to, to talk to me, to talk it through with me. He felt he had to do it as a matter of integrity. So even if, even if his reading of the video is wrong and yours is right, he, he felt he was acting in a moral manner uh, and was making a tremendous personal and financial sacrifice to do it. The Daily Wire had not taken off at that point. So you're just, you're just incorrect about his motives there. I mean, I, and I know it because I was talking to him on the scene at the time. Uh, what, was your, what was the second one about again? Uh, uh, YAF. YAF, okay. Michelle Malkin. Now, now listen, I, I believe in, in free speech and everybody's free speech. I don't believe, even if I hate what a guy is saying, I certainly believe, don't believe he should be deplatformed from YouTube unless he's calling for violence, unless, unless you're literally calling for violence. I certainly don't believe you should be uh, kicked off Twitter or any of this stuff. I think it's all garbage. You know, let people talk. I believe in good ideas. I believe good ideas will win. Okay? However, YAF is an organization that subsidizes and arranges people to speak in ways that they agree with or in a range of ways that fit into the big umbrella of conservatism. They felt Michelle Malkin had left that tent and they had the perfect right to not support her and not subsidize her. They're not a plat YAF is not a platform. YAF is an organization that supports a certain series of ideas. So whether, I, you know, I'm not sure what I would have done. Uh, I think they did the right thing because they felt that she had stepped outside of their uh, idea of conservatism. And I gotta be honest with you, I feel she did too. I, I mean, I don't know Michelle, but I always respected her. And I was really surprised because I felt that she, in her passion for immigration reform, which is desperately needed, uh, had given a fig leaf, basically, uh, to some very bad ideas. So I felt she was in the wrong. But the question of whether her free speech was violated, it simply wasn't. It simply wasn't. Yaf has the right to support the speakers who represent them, and they felt she didn't anymore. This is 
going to be our last question. Hi, first of all, big fan. I've written in your show a couple times and you've given me some very meaningful advice. So oh, thank you very much. That's nice much. to hear, thanks. Um, my question greatly condenses a myriad of conversations I've had with two of the smartest and godliest guys that I know, my husband and my twin sister's husband. So I hope in condensing I'm not misrepresenting them. They good-naturedly roll their eyes at the time my sister and I spend paying attention to political conversations because they think the gospel of Christ is better served amid persecution, so they don't see the point in spending time on it. And in fact, they see positives in these clear lines of demarcation being drawn in the culture. I see their argument that we as individuals better serve the gospel in our communities as they do leading a Bible study here on UCF's campus, but I just cannot get behind their assertion that paying attention to politics and working to affect the culture in the political arena is pointless. How would you as a believer and a very politically involved individual respond? Well, I've never understood this idea that Christ suffered so we should seek out suffering. Christ didn't seek out suffering. Christ prayed desperately to be relieved of suffering, prayed that that cup of suffering would pass from him because he was a person and nobody likes to suffer. It is true that in suffering, uh, you rise. There's no question about it. Suffering can bring you to a new and better place, but you don't seek it out, right? You seek out uh, peace and, and pleasure. That is the way human beings are made. That is the way God made us to be. So, you know, it, it wasn't for nothing that Jesus was praying to be let off the hook. You know, I mean, that is, that is what we all do. So I don't understand why uh, political action, which is one of the main ways human beings interact, why that should be useless. I, I, don't, I, do understand, I do understand why Christ is above political action, why you should be able to go to church and sit next to somebody who disagrees with you and both feel that you've received the gospel. That, that makes sense to me. But it doesn't make sense to me that then you should leave church and not return to fighting for the things that you deeply believe in. Why, why would you do that? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I mean, so many things have been achieved through political action, the ends of slavery, the, uh, the beginning of wider rights. I, you know, I don't see why that would be unimportant to God, uh, even though he might be above both parties as they fight for those things. We done? Oh, all right. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks a lot.